So today we'll be going over what's called Poisson's Ratio. And to go back to a simple example, let's say we have a cylinder. And let's also say this cylinder is being compressed by this force. F. Now, doing from the previous videos, we already know how to calculate the, the deformation of this cylinder. However, once it is deformed, it actually compresses a bit, right, which is that deformation. It essentially becomes um, shorter. Now, keep in mind, in these drawings, I am exaggerating a bit. However, once this is compressed, when it comes to the cylinder itself, you have to keep in mind that the volume stays the same. So when the length actually decreases, that means all the material is being squished and it actually the width actually would increase from its original um, width. So we have the final width and the initial width here. So we see whenever an object is being compressed, the volume stays the same. So if we have any dimension either shrinking or increasing, then the other dimension is going to do the opposite, right? In this case, if the length um, contracts, the width actually um, expands here such that the volume stays the same. So we actually have two axes here. We have the longitudinal axis and the lateral axis here. So we already know when it comes to the strain, we're able to calculate it, right? Which is a change in length divided by the original length or essentially a deformation divided by the length. And this was for the longitudinal axis. However, there it will be strained laterally as well. We could call it the change in the width divided by the original width here you could use whatever symbols are you're more you're more um, familiar with so we do have a strain in the longitudinal as well as the lateral axis so this is what's known as poisson's ratio or nu which essentially is the ratio between them so we have um the la lateral strain over the longitudinal strain and this is Poisson's ratio and we actually have the data tabulated depending on what material it is we do have a Poisson's ratio in record such that we could use it to our advantage to solve any potential unknowns in a problem statement so notice that it does have a negative sign because when when it's strained and longitudinally, either one of the dimensions increases or decreases, the other one is going to do the exact opposite. So we will always have that negative sign. Now let's go ahead and do an example using Poisson's ratio to show how useful it can be. So for this problem statement, we have the rigid beam rests in the horizontal position on the two 2014 T6 aluminum cylinders having the unloaded lengths shown. If each cylinder has a diameter of 30 millimeters, determine the placement X of the applied 80 kN load so that the beam remains horizontal. What is the new diameter of cylinder A after the load is applied? So the first question in this problem statement asks us, what is this dimension X such that this beam remains horizontal? Meaning the, the deformations of both of the cylinders here is exactly the same. So we have the diameters of these cylinders, which is 30 millimeters each. And keeping in mind that this ground isn't so level, which is why we have that difference in length. We have cylinder B being 210 millimeters, cylinder A being 220 millimeters in length. So we have two things to solve. Now, our intuition going back to statics, basically, well, if we want these two to deform the same way, then we intuitively want it to have the same force. So wouldn't X just be half of three meters well in this case since the lengths are different the going back to the deformation equation which is p l over e a the deformation is dependent on the length as well and if the length is not the same that means the deformation won't be the same so this is where we basically utilize the relationships that we know um, which is to keep this beam horizontal, the deformation of cylinder A and cylinder B 
have to be the same. So let's go ahead and write that. So deformations of both of the cylinders A and B is equivalent having the deformation equation. We have P A L A divided by the modulus of elasticity times the cross-sectional area. Now I didn't include any subscripts for the modulus as well as the cross-sectional because they are the same. They actually will cancel out having this relationship. And now in this case, you could actually solve for either or of the forces and come up with a relationship. So let's solve in this case for PA. So PA is equal to LB over LA over times PB. So this is one relationship that we're going to be using. Now we could go ahead and do the static equilibrium, do the summation um, of forces with respect to the y-axis. Let's go ahead and do that. So we have these reaction forces. We could say PA plus PB because they're both in the positive direction going upwards. And 80 kilonewtons is downwards negative is equal to zero. And we could just plug in the relationship that we have before to solve for the, the forces here. So once we factor out the PB, we get LB over LA plus 1 is equal to 80. Now divide this by both sides to solve for PB, and we end up getting 40.93 kilonewtons. Now, since we have PB, we could easily solve for PA just using the ratios of the lengths, right? The 210 millimeters divided by 220, and so we get for PA 39.07 kilonewton. So right here we're able to solve for how much force each of those cylinders are taking or the reactionary forces and we see they are not equivalent. So now to f solve for the x here we actually do the sum of moments we could do with respect to a or b. I'm gonna go ahead and do it with respect to a. So we get 80 kilonewtons times this variable x and this is negative because it has a negative moment plus PB times the 3 meters, which is the perpendicular length, which causes this kind of moment being equal to 0. So now, since we previously saw for this variable PB, we already have that force. We could go ahead and solve for X. So X is 1.53 meters. It's not exactly the geometric center of the length, which is 1.5 meters, is a little bit more towards the right because we do have that difference in the forces of each of those cylinders such that the deformation is the same. So it could be a little bit counterintuitive at times, but remember, just use the fundamental principles and you should, and you will be getting the correct answer. So now we solved for the X, um, the location where that 80 kilonewton should be located. Now, the second question that asked us was, what was the new diameter of cylinder A? So in this case, we have the force in cylinder A, so we have the deformation. So deformation is equal to, so the force in cylinder A is 39.07 kilonewtons. The length of it converted into meters is 0.22 meters. And in this case, we have the modulus of elasticity. Usually, usually you could get it from a table in your book. And in this case, for aluminum, it's 73.1 gigapascals for the modulus of elasticity. So I'm going to go ahead and convert it to kilopascals or kilonewtons per meter squared, which is 73.1 times 10 to the power of 6 kilonewtons per meter squared times a cross-sectional area of that cylinder which is pi over 4 diameter squared converted to meters again to make sure all the units cancel out meter squared meter squared kilonewtons kilonewtons so we have a deformation in meters now one thing we could go ahead and convert it back to millimeters or you could convert everything into millimeters it depends what's your preference but in my particular case i would prefer to do the conversion after the calculations so the units are more um more familiar so deformation is 0 0.166 millimeters that's how much cylinder a deform so now this is where we utilize Poisson's 
ratio, right? So Poisson's ratio is equal to negative the strain, the lateral strain divided by the longitudinal strain. Now here we could, since we already have Poisson's ratio given, we could go ahead and solve for the lateral strain in this case. So let's go ahead and do that. So the lateral strain is equivalent to negative Poisson's ratio times the longitudinal strain. So we know Poisson's ratio is 0.35. Now the change in the length is 0.166 millimeters. But keep in mind, since it contracted or it shrunk, the final length was actually smaller than the initial length. And since we do the final minus the initial, this value will give us a negative sign here so this is where this negative sign came from divided by the original length of that cylinder which is 220 millimeters so now the negatives cancels out and we get the lateral strain being equal to 0 0.00264091 so this is the lateral strain Keep in mind the lateral strain is similarly to the longitudinal strain. In this case, the la lateral, we're talking about the cylinder would be the final diameter minus the initial diameter divided by that initial or original diameter. Now, we could go ahead and manipulate this to finally solve for what the final diameter of the cylinder is once it has deformed. So that final diameter is equal to that lateral strain times the initial diameter plus the initial diameter which at the end of the day gives us 30.008 millimeters is the final diameter of that cylinder. Since the length of the cylinder contracted, the diameter actually expanded to compensate for that constant volume that we have of that cylinder. And so finally, we get the final diameter, which is 30.008 millimeters. As you can see, it's not significant, so it's something that's not going to be visually detectable however it is there and this is how you calculate using the Poisson's ratio which is the ratio between the lateral strain and the longitudinal strain and so this is the main reason why Poisson's ratio is very useful and different materials have in fact different Poisson's ratio